I enjoy when people, be careful how you hear this, I enjoy when people go through trials and profess and share the grace of God in their life and how God, through His mercy and His grace, brought them through those trials and they honor God in those trials. And I, I enjoy His testimony. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Ephesians chapter 3 as we continue on. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3, if you would, let's just stand together. We're going to read the first four verses there. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery of um, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Father, we ask that you again bless this time together, that you bless the reading of your word. Father, control the preaching of your word, that your words are what is spoken and not this preacher's. Father, we thank you and we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Don't know how far we'll get this morning. We'll just pick it up next week, whatever we don't get this morning. But we'll look now as we as we continue on in Ephesians, the mystery of the church. You know, Paul is writing this from his from prison. He's in his first Roman imprisonment, and he wrote this in Colossians, some others while different books while he was in prison. I like the fact that Paul, um, if you if you put Paul in prison, all he does is start writing letters and lays out the groundwork for the church. If you turn him loose, he just stands the world on end, telling people in person about the gospel and how God has, say, has provided salvation for us. And as he's moving on now, he starts talking about the church. He is trying to help the Ephesians, and, and actually there's a, there's, a, um, there's a good argument that this was not specifically written to the church at Ephesus, but it was written to the area of Ephesus. It was a circulating letter because it's not, he doesn't have a personal um, uh, a greeting in it to the church specifically or whoever. And apparently Colossians was written before this, and so maybe that's what he's referencing when he says, you know, that you've read, uh, or when you read my, my other letter, short letter, then you'll understand some of these other things. But Paul is establishing now the church. He's talked about what God has done for us, that we have been chosen, and that because of him, if we've trusted Christ, we are new, and we are a new creature, and we are here to, to do good things for God. We are here to share the gospel, to do good works uh, in honor of God. And he talked about how there's no more petition between Jew and Gentile. We're, we're one. Now we're made one in Christ. And now he wants to talk about the church specifically. He's going, he starts by saying, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. So notice Paul is in prison, but he doesn't blame the Jews or the Romans. He is in jail because of the Jews, and he's under Roman custody. But he says, the prisoner of Jesus Christ and for you Gentiles. Paul was preaching to the Gentiles. God called him specifically to be the minister to the Gentiles, to bring the gospel to the Gentile world. And the Jews despised not only the gospel, but they really despised Paul's attention to the Gentiles. Remember, under the law, if you're not a Jew, you're considered unclean. And the Jews didn't want to have anything to do with that which is unclean. They, they're so hung up in their ceremony that they forgot their purpose of evangelizing the world to be the representative of God to man, which is what the church's responsibility to today is, to represent God to man, to give the gospel. And Paul says, I'm a prisoner for you because I'm coming to you. God has called me to, to be your minister, to bring you the mystery that God has revealed to me, and to tell you about it, and because of that, I'm I am in prison. He said, if you heard of the dispensation, and that word is taken from the word we get stewardship. So if you've heard of the stewardship of the grace of God, which is given me to you, speaking to the Gentiles, how by revelation. Yeah, and notice Paul is a prisoner for the truth, but he's also a steward of the grace of God. And specifically to the Gentile in relation to this. But he says, I, I didn't get this from the other apostles. I didn't get this from all my schooling and great learning. I got this by revelation. Remember when Paul received Christ. 
He went on into Damascus. He was seen and, and baptized. And then he went, if you follow his life, he went and saw Peter only. He didn't see any of the other apostles. He saw Peter, and then he disappeared out to Sinai to be taught by God. One writer said he, he went into the desert with the law and the and Psalms and the prophets, and he came out with Ephesians and Colossians in his heart. So Paul was taught by Christ. He was taught personally. And so he, all these things were revealed to him. These, he said, this is by revelation. So this isn't something I've just come up with. This isn't something that had just happened. This is revealed. And so he says, here's the revelation. There's this mystery. There's a mystery that I've been given, and I am to here to share that with you. And in verse 5 he said, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be followers and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So he says, here, let me just reveal the mystery to you. Now, I don't know about you, but I like mysteries. Angie and I watch crime shows and things like that, mystery shows. We like to figure them out. We're, we're Hitchcock fans. I mean, I remember all the old Hitchcock movies. One of those fantastic, the twist and the redirection, and, and I just like all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and I mentioned in the bulletin in, in my article that, you know, I hear people all the time talking about, well, the Bible's boring, it's dull, it's just a bunch of do's and don'ts, it's, you know, it's whatever. You know, the Bible has all sorts of things in it, and one of those is mystery. And it's, there's, this mystery is through the Old Testament, is in the Old Testament, but it's not revealed. People don't know what it is. The prophets don't understand it. They can't see it. And, and so he says, here's this mystery, and I'm going to tell you what this mystery is. And he said this mystery is the church. And this mystery is revealed. It wasn't revealed in time past. It was hinted at. It was undertones and undercurrents, but it was hinted at, but it was not revealed to men yet, but it's revealed now to his holy apostles and to the prophets. And I want you to listen carefully, because I'm going to say some things that are really going to upset a few folks here and there in this world, and I want to make sure you understand, so I want to make a blanket statement here before we begin. The church, as we talk about the church, this body of believers, is local. There's not an unseen, universal, whatever church that everybody who's saved just becomes a part of, and, and so we don't need to meet and all that. So don't, don't get into your mind that I believe in universal church. However, there is a universal nature of the church. God speaks to the church as a local body, and then he speaks of all believers as being a body, being a church. Let me give you some examples. Christ revealed this to the apostles. He revealed the universal nature of the church. Again, we're not talking about a universal church as people teach universal church. We're talking about a nature of the church, of the local church. He said in Matthew 16, beginning in verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I know people argue, he, he was talking to the disciples there, so that was local church. He said, I'm going to build my church. Which church? Unity? Ephesus? Laodicea? Which church? All the churches? So he's speaking of the church. I'm going to build my church. The church is made up of local bodies, local assemblies, local groups that are visible carrying out the work of Christ. But when he says that Christ gave himself for the singular church, which church did he give himself for and how many others are left out of that? So do you understand what I'm telling you? We're not talking about a universal church. We're talking about a universal nature of the church, meaning all of the churches local. So he speaks of the churches universally or in a universal nature. And if you strongly disagree with this, don't call me on the phone. Just go look at Scripture and see what he says. The church is local nature. Now, we go on, and Christ again talks about the church in chapter 18 of Matthew. And now it gets real personal and real local. And, he, and, and through this, he points out 
that the church to function must be a local visible body of believers. Because in verse 18, ver, I mean, chapter 18, verse 15, he says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his faults between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as heathen man and a publican. So here we see that the church is local. When you start talking about function, the church must be local. If there's a universal church, how are we supposed to take people who, who have offended and refused to get right with God, how are we supposed to take them to the church? Who do we take them to? We stand out in the front yard and declare, hey, I'm bringing you before the universal church so everybody spiritually listen. See, they can't work. By the way, this is also a verse that shows that Jesus started the church during his ministry. If the church doesn't exist, then Christ just told them to do something that's impossible to do. If the church didn't start until Pentecost, then how were they in Jesus' day before the cross supposed to bring people to the church for discipline issues? So the church was formed under Jesus Christ in his ministry, during his ministry on this earth. Christ started the church. Okay? So, the church has a universal nature in that all of the churches everywhere that are true godly churches, they're true churches, and the church in function and in, in reality is always local. There's not this invisible thing. And we will be universal one day, right? When the rapture takes place, we will all be one church. And we will all have our doctrines correct at that moment. <laughs> Don't you know it's going to be interesting sitting with the Lord together when he said, now you guys over here, you missed the boat on this. And you know what we're going to be doing? Uh-huh. We told you. We told. We tried to tell you. Put it in all of our... See, we told you. And then God's going to say, and you... <laughs> yes, Lord. You blew it right here. <laughs> We're going to get all straightened out one day. And then we will be the universal, the universal church because there won't be anything else but the people of God in eternity. Christ will be the head. So he revealed it to the apostles. But he also said it was revealed to the prophets. Even though they did not understand what they were seeing, what they were being told, it was revealed to the The church was revealed, but it was, it was just fly-by mentions that they... They couldn't understand. They couldn't see. But in Romans uh, verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 8, Paul says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, it is, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah say, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. Now they thought this was meaning that the Messiah would come and be the ruler over the Gentiles, and that is included in this thought, but they didn't understand that the Gentiles are going to be made one with the Jews in Jesus Christ. They couldn't understand that. They couldn't see that. That portion of it was not revealed to them. But these verses are taken from Psalms, Deuteronomy, and Isaiah. So they were in the Old Testament. The prophets had a glimpse, but they just couldn't grasp it because God chose not to reveal the nature of the church to them. So then he goes on, and he says, beginning in verse, um, uh, verse 6 there, he said, he said that we would... Um, wow, I just lost my verse. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. 
So Matthew 10, 5 through 7, Jesus tells them, he's telling his 12, he says, these 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 15 again, he said, then Jesus, verse 21, then Jesus went hence, thence, and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. His disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she, this Gentile woman, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it even unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So even during Christ's ministry, it was not revealed yet that the Gentiles would be part of the church, and Christ's ministry was to the Jew. Even here you see an example, but you also see an example of the gospel being given to the Gentile. You know, I find it interesting that we, we, we put all these things in dispensations and, and groupings. We say, well, you know, Peter is the one who brought the gospel to the Gentile. Peter had that vision of the, all the different foods coming down. The sheet, no, I won't eat, I won't eat, and, and this is unclean. And, and the voice that says, what I've called clean, let no man call unclean. At the same time he's having this vision, Cornelius is offering to a God that he doesn't know who he is, but he knows there's a God that's not made by hands, and it's not one of these that is in his area. And he knows somebody is there, and he's praying, and he's worshiping, and he's giving, giving sacrifices. And an angel shows up and says, Cornelius, your prayers... And your offerings have come up to God as a sweet savor. Now send men to Joppa and find this guy named Peter and bring him back and he's going to tell you everything that you need to know. So we're going to see, Peter opened the door to the Gentiles. I think Jesus did that first. Jesus is the one who brought the gospel to a Gentile woman right here. Jesus is the one who brought the gospel to a centurion who is asking for help for his servant. Jesus did all this first. We look on human ways and say, oh yeah, well this or this or this. And sometimes we miss the subtleties in Scripture. We miss the simple points. And then Paul says that he is going to be the messenger in this mystery. <laughs> Ephesians 3, back to Ephesians 3, verse 7, he said, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. He said, listen, this is my duty. This is my calling. This is what I'm here for. And notice Paul says that he is the least of all the saints. Why did he say that? Paul often mentioned not being worthy. And in one place he mentioned it because he persecuted the church. Paul consented unto the death of Christians. Paul did his best to destroy the church. Paul struggled with this stuff. And Paul found it a great honor. In fact, Paul found it a great honor to suffer for Christ, to be imprisoned, to be, to be beaten, to be abused. And he said, this mystery, this church, the Gentiles being one in the gospel of Christ, this is what I'm here to tell you. This is what my purpose, my job, my duty is. He said, so let me tell you now the purpose and the power of the church, as we end the verse, at verse 9 there, he introduces us again to Jesus Christ. God created all things by Christ Jesus, or by Jesus Christ. So he says down verse 10 and 11, he says, to the intent, 
now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. He said one of our duties, one of the purposes of the church is to reveal the wisdom of God to the angels. Have you ever thought about that? Remember when Peter talked about the things of salvation, the things of the church, and how the angels desire to look into those things? It's beyond them. The angels had no plan of redemption. The angels had a choice. They, they had an opportunity in their existence to choose God or to disobey God, to, to reject God. Those that chose God were made unable to sin from that point on. They were sealed for eternity. Those that chose to go against God were sealed for eternity as well, but they were sealed from ever not sinning. And they were cast out of heaven. A third, a third of the angels followed Satan in his rebellion. And there was no redemption. It was one and out. You got one chance. You make a choice today. After this, there's no more choices and there's no more options. Your fate is sealed now with this decision. But to us, there's a plan of redemption. And it was so from the beginning. And the Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And as you go through and read all those days, and you read other places, He says that He created the heavens and all that in them is. And he describes creating our lower atmosphere space and then a heavenly realm that is beyond us, beyond our universe, beyond anything. So where he dwells or where the angels dwell. So in the day that he created everything, he also created the angels. So they weren't sitting around in the council of the Trinity when they were talking about creating the world and then this plan of redemption that they were going to execute. They weren't there because they were created after and they had no story of redemption. They had no way to get back once they fell. And so they had a one time and out, and here they are, and they're looking into this stuff. They're sent out to do the bidding of God, but this idea of redemption is foreign, and they desire to look into those things. And Paul says that one of the purposes of the church is to finally now reveal to powers and principalities the wisdom of God. And to do that according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus. And he said it is also to make bold access to God. This salvation that we have that dissolved the ceremonial law, that fulfilled it and, and, and carried on and began what we call the age or the dispensation of grace. That was so that we could have boldness and access. Look what he said in verse 3.12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of Him. He said, listen, He, he did all this through Christ. And it is in Christ that we, the people of God, have access to God and can do that boldly. Hebrews says we can come boldly before the throne of God, knowing that we will not be cast out, knowing that He will not reject us. He also tells us that, that, is, that Christ brings inner strength. And this revelation of this, of this grace that allows even the Gentiles to be part of the gospel gives us inner strength. He said in verse 13, he says, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulation for you, which is your glory for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. This is awesome stuff. This is, the, this is the, the new covenant that he made with Israel that Israel, the nation, rejected. And he turned to the Gentiles and grafted the Gentiles into this covenant that he would write his words on our heart, that he would be our God, he would dwell inside us. And then he said also this is for, that, that Christ did this for comprehension. Verse 17, he said, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. How many times have we, have we listened to people or heard somebody say, well, you know, I read a little bit, but you know that's just you just can't understand that stuff in that Bible. 
here he says that by the Spirit of God, thanks to Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of God, the church, the saved, are indwelled by God, by the Spirit of God, so that we can comprehend the depth and the height and the breadth of things. And to know the love of God. In fact, it's the very next verse. He says, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You realize the love of God cannot be known apart from God. Cannot be known apart from the spiritual indwelling. You can understand a God that sends His Son to die, but to truly grasp, to understand His love that passes knowledge, the love of God doesn't come from just reading and getting mental assent. It comes from salvation and the Holy Spirit of God giving us the revelation of His love. It is past knowledge. How many of us can honestly say that the love of God has been so profound in our life, we don't know how to truly explain it? There's no way, there's no base of knowledge to say, here, look in this book. Here, read this thing. Here, here's this scientific fact. The love of God passes knowledge. It doesn't make sense to us in, an un, in, in a natural state, in an unsafe state, why would you give your son to die for a bunch of people that are going to spit on him and mock him and, and crucify him and do all that? Why would you do that? I mean, how many of us have neighbors we don't even want to loan anything to because they never return it? Or it gets returned broken. And Jesus gave his son to die for far worse than a difficult neighbor. And he chose to give his son before he ever created the first human. He said, listen, if you want to understand the depth and the height and the breadth of this, it's going to take the Holy Spirit of God, and that comes from Jesus Christ. This is part of the mystery of the church. This, the Gentiles being drawn into this understanding, into this love. And then he talks about the church's glory. And look at that, we're actually going to get it done. In verse 20, he's now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, without world or without end. Amen. Well, let's go back and look at this again. Now, unto him, who's him? God the Father. Unto to God that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we all that we ask or think how many times do we have difficulty in life and we try everything there is to try and then we come to God in desperation and in and if we were to be honest we came to him last cuz really and truly we don't really believe he will do all the things we read in the Bible. We think all that great power was part of the Old Testament. All that great power is part of the Gospels. All that great power, all those great things, that was all, that was a different, if, if we were to trust that, if God would start doing something great like that, people would think we would lost our mind. People would think we'd gone crazy. If we were out here talking about the great power of God and the miracles he was doing and, and all the things that were going on, we, people just think we're stupid. We just don't, we don't see that kind of stuff. We don't see the sea parting. We don't see people commanding fire down out of heaven. So therefore, all of that power of God, that was Old Testament, that was gospel times, but that's not for today. Has anybody seen any miracles in their life? Any? Has anybody ever been part of one? I'm not talking about some of the crazy things we saw in Scripture where the Red Sea was parted and Israel passed on dry ground and then the armies were destroyed. Even with all the intellectuals that, well, we know really that was the Reed Sea and it's only about knee-deep water. That's even more amazing. God swallowed up an entire army in knee-deep water. That's pretty cool. What an amazing God. I've told you my testimony before of getting peanuts and having no phone, no car, no way to get to a doctor. And folks, Angie can tell you she's witnessed me and peanuts and what happens. It's a death knell for me. 
no medicine, no phone, nothing. And so Daddy said, we're just going to have to go to the big doctor. And we sat and prayed, don't know how long, but when we got through, Dad looked at me and said, go look in the mirror. And there was no sign of any kind that I had gotten peanuts. And moments before that, I was losing my ability to breathe. I was swollen so bad. My throat was closing up. My eyes were swelled shut. My lips were turned inside out. I was turning blue. I was doing all the things that I do when I try to die from peanuts and have no access to medicine. And yet moments later, this wasn't a, you know, oh, look in the mirror. Things are starting to go down. It was look in the mirror. I was totally normal. God still does miracles. God has the power to do more than we can ask. And he didn't just say more. He said exceeding abundantly more than we can ask. Why do we not ask for anything? Now, James warns us, if we're not careful, we'll ask according to our lust, and God won't answer that because we're only asking to consume it on our lust. God, I need a Mercedes. You don't need a Mercedes. You might need a car, but you don't need a Mercedes. I need a Rolls Royce. I need a $2 million house. I listened to the wife of one of the televangelists one time sharing her testimony saying they drove by this mansion, they saw this big mansion, and, and she said, oh, I want that. And she walked over and she grabbed the gates of that property and she claimed it in the name of God and now she lives in it. I thought that was called covetous. In the Bible, what about the people that were living in it? What do we do with them? Just kick them out? Are they homeless now? What's the story? That's not what God does. But God does answer prayer. And He can answer exceeding abundantly more than we can ever ask. So I don't care how, how crazy we think the request is. If it's a real request, it's an honest request, God is able to do exceeding abundantly more than we can ever ask. But He didn't even stop there. He says, or think. There is nothing we will think of that God can't do exceeding abundantly more. You have a ministry in your mind. Have you ever thought, boy, if I just had this or if I just had that, if I was just made this way, I would go and do. If God's put a love in your heart for something, go do it. Well, I don't have. Don't make excuses. Just go do it. Just say yes to God because he's able to do exceeding abundantly more than we can think or ask. He says unto him, God, who can do all of this. He said, no, by the way. He does this according to the power that worketh in us. <laughs> in us. Is he saying that we have power, that we are such mighty men and women? He's talking about the Spirit of God that dwells in us, right? He said he can do all these things exceeding abundantly above all that we can think or, or, or ask. And he does that through the power that works in us, the Holy Spirit of God that dwells in us. It works in us. He says, unto him, unto him. That one, that God, the God, the only true God who can do exceeding abundantly above everything we could ask or think. He said, unto Him be glory. So the glory goes to the Father. Where is that glory? It's in the church. We, we, by tapping this power and allowing God to work in us, demonstrate the glory of God. I've heard people say, the only place that God gets glory is in the church. Wrong. Jesus said very clearly, here in my, is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. Now, I know people say, see, no, but that's in the church. Okay. When we, the church, Allow the power of God to work. It brings glory to God. Because it is Christ who God purposed to carry out the sacrifice and to build this church where the Gentiles will be grafted into the gospel. It is Jesus Christ who reveals his love. It is Jesus Christ who does all of this through the Spirit. So he says, unto God be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. What do we as humans have to offer? Nothing. That's why Paul says, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. But it's also why he says, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die 
is gain. He said, I'll glory in the cross and nothing else. Because that's what it's all about. The church. This day and time, this is all about Jesus Christ. It's always been about Jesus Christ. It will always be about Jesus Christ. This is it. The centerpiece of all of God's work, the centerpiece of His message, the centerpiece of His love is His Son. We put all of this into the church. We praise the church. We glorify the church. We talk about the church. We make the church this. We make the church that. And the Bible says that the glory is to God by Jesus Christ, and He's going to use the church in there. It's all about Jesus. It's why Philippians says that He gave Jesus a name above every name. Not the church. Jesus. We must be careful that we do not take the church to where it doesn't belong. But we must be careful that we don't hit the extremes. That in, in diminishing the church back to where its rightful place is, being under the headship of Jesus Christ in a, in a tool to create glory for God, we mustn't, in our diminishing to the right position, also take the idea that church is not important. Well, you know, you can worship God wherever you're at. You don't have to be in church. I can worship God out of my boat. I can worship God out of my tree stand. Are you worshiping God while you're there? Are you worshiping God when you're in the boat? And if God said that one of our commandments is to assemble ourselves together, if we're not assembled together, are we honoring God? So are we glorifying God in the tree stand if we're disobeying God by not being in church? But we also have to avoid the other extreme that we find ourselves in so much when we talk about the church and the church is everything and it's all about the church and everything's about the church. Everything is about Jesus Christ. The church is a tool. And when Christ talks about the church, He's talking about His covenant relationship with His people. And how the Gentiles will be grafted in through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and the partial rejection of Israel. We are to glorify God. And this has been a mystery from the beginning until Paul. That all people, not just the Jews, all people would have access openly to God through Jesus Christ. So there's no room for boasting any longer, right? Now what he said in chapter 2, for salvation by grace through faith, not that any should boast. So he said, let me tell you about this mystery. It's God blending all people of the earth together into one in Christ Jesus. The emphasis is Christ, not the church. Jesus and His sacrifice. We must get our attention right. Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is first. And I'm telling you, whether we're talking about the church, our local assemblies, or we're talking about the individual, Jesus is the single most important part. Without Jesus, there is no salvation. Without Jesus, there is no way to heaven. Without Jesus, we are lost in our sin, we are undone, and we will spend eternity in torture and punishment. But because of Jesus, His price that He paid, the sacrifice on the cross, brought to us salvation. He paid the debt that we couldn't pay. He became the sacrifice for sin. If we want to be saved, we must trust Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible belief is all about. Believing to the point that we trust Christ for salvation. And then churches, if we are to succeed as a body of believers, as an organism, Jesus must be first and foremost. Not the preacher, not the music guy, not the teachers, not the building, not the organism. Jesus Christ. A church without Christ as the head 
is not a church. I don't care what your name is. I don't care what your doctrinal stance is. If Christ is not the head of the organism, it is not a church. Jesus must be first. Is the church important? Absolutely. It's God's method today of getting the gospel to the world. Is it more important than Jesus? Absolutely not. So we got to get this right. We got to get the balance back in who we are and what we are. Let's stand to our feet. Father, we thank you that you left us your word. We thank you that you formed in all of us a body. That we can be one with you through Jesus Christ, through salvation, and through your Spirit. And that we can band together and carry out your commission and and be a source of glory for you if we allow Christ to do the work. Father, we thank you even more just for salvation alone because without Jesus we would have no hope and there would be no heaven. And we're grateful that you provided heaven. You provided forgiveness. You provided life through your Son. We thank you for sacrificing him for us. We thank you for raising him from the dead. And we thank you that he intercedes for us forevermore. Father, help us now to make whatever decision we need to make for you. That we get this down and that we are not afraid to take big steps because of the power that works in us through your Holy Spirit. Father, touch us and show us what we need this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.